I want to give you 10 reasons, or not reasons, but 10 things that Catholics want non-Catholics to know about them. What's up everybody? This is Joshy Red from Practical Theism, and today I want to give you 10 reasons, or not reasons, but 10 things that Catholics want non-Catholics to know about them. So in the stratosphere, online, no matter where you go, there is no shortage of people who are bagging on the Catholic Church for a whole wide variety of reasons. I've gotten this kind of prejudice against myself. Um, I've seen it levied against a bunch of other people, and quite honestly, it's disingenuous. It's disheartening to see that so many people lob these uh, objections against Catholics and for something they don't even understand, or that they haven't they have misconceptions about specific things. So that'd be an interesting thought to share um, some things that Catholic Christians want non-Catholic Christians to know because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Okay, so, number one, we, Catholics, love the scriptures. In fact, we believe that our entire belief system is predicated and built upon them, though we don't use the scriptures in isolation. So everything is built, ebbs and flows from what we would dub the word of God. Now, when we say word of God, it can be interchangeable with two things, the word of God, meaning the scriptures, or the word of God, meaning God made flesh. The word became flesh, Jesus Christ. So our belief is that first and foremost, our faith is one that is based on the word of God, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. And the scriptures come out of this great tradition that we have, um, based, uh, that, that is what we believe is um, books that were penned by men, but uh, written and inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we love the scriptures. The, the belief comes from it. The scriptures are built into everything that we do, especially and most particularly the mass and the liturgy. Um, if you've ever, if you've never gone to a Catholic mass, I recommend you do because there is scripture all over the place. So the scriptures are embedded in everything that we do. Uh, we always encourage reading of the scriptures and daily scripture study. Um, if you actually just go to mass, <laughs> so there are three scripture readings that are read in mass. You have the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, a reading from the New Testament, a reading from uh, the Gospels, one of the Gospels. And we also have some of the Psalms. We actually sing the Psalms in there. So scriptures is just everywhere. We just, we love God's word. We love breaking it open and uh, having a good dialogue and discussion about it. Now, to be fair, on the flip side of that, I do think that one of the levied objections against Catholics, which I think it's valid, is that some Catholics don't know the scriptures as well. And that's very valid. I would propose to you that some evangelicals or non-Catholics don't know the scriptures as well as some other evangelicals or non-Catholics. So I think it goes all the way around full circle. Bottom line, everybody should, if you are a believer, needs to get back into the scriptures because it's so vital and important. Number two, we are happy. <laughs> um, I, I, we're happy. <laughs> we're happy. I, I put this in there in particular uh, because I have heard even some friends who are like, ah, those Catholics, they're so miserable. They look miserable. They're just always miserable. They seem to always have a frown on their face. They're just not genuinely happy people. And this is a, a really interesting uh, thing that I want non-Catholics to know about Catholics is that just because somebody doesn't walk around with you know, happy-go-lucky and big smile teeth on their face 100% of every single day does not mean that they don't have happiness. That does not mean that they don't have um, inner peace. Some people are much more internal. Um, I have found in the Christian and more Orthodox traditions about the peace that they receive in their faith, and they're not as external about it. And I have found a lot of non-Catholics 
to be a lot more external. I tend to think that I kind of share a little bit of both. I have, uh, I definitely have found the beauty of the internal peace and what you get by just being present um, with our Lord and in prayer and uh, just silence. There's beauty in silence. And I, I love that. But at the same token, I recognize fully that we are physical creatures. And so we need some sort of physicality and energy and mojo. And so that external peace has its place. And so I, I definitely like to share that and exhibit that. And I genuinely just get happy and excited. And I think we do need to, to see and show more of that. But just because somebody doesn't walk around um, the way and talk about things the way that an evangelical or non-Catholic does doesn't mean that they're not happy and they have a great internal disposition. All right, number three, we love Jesus. Holy cow, Jesus is the source and summit of the faith. Jesus in the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith. Everything ebbs and flows and revolves around Jesus. Um, just think of the credo that we recite the Nicene Creed every Sunday at Mass. It's entirely Christocentric. Everything about the Mass ebbs and flows through the Eucharist, which we believe to be the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. It ebbs and flows, and the center point, the focal point, is, is Jesus. Jesus is everything. Um, if Jesus isn't who he says he is, then Christianity, let alone Catholic Christianity, is just false and we should go along with our merry lives. So everything kind of hinges on the person of Christ and we love Jesus, everything about him. He is the son of God. And so um, I want to make sure you guys know that because there I have heard um, through debates and then dialogues and discussions, there are some non-Catholic Christians who don't think that um, Catholics are Christians particularly because they don't feel they have a Christocentric view. So not that, but the reason why a lot of people share that view is because they believe that um, Catholics worship saints, uh, which brings me to my fourth point. We do not worship the saints, uh, period. We believe in something called the communion of saints, which stems from the understanding and belief that Jesus bridges the gap between divinity and humanity. He is divine and human fully in the fullest essence of both, uh, both beings, if you will. They call that the hypostatic union. Jesus is fully man and fully divine. Therefore, the meeting point between divinity and humanity. And because of that, uh, he's effectively bridged down here, the world down here with the spiritual world over there. And so the communion of saints is um, the belief that everybody is connected through Christ. And so our brothers and sisters in Christ who have passed on and gone into heaven, into glory with our Lord, um, we still have access to them in the life of prayer and uh, communication. In the same way that I ask my brothers and sisters down here to pray for me, I can ask the saints from before me to pray for me because of and lift me up in prayer because of that and so we don't worship them uh we do venerate them uh in the sense not in the sense of uh worship you know due to god and god alone um, but we have a very deep and profound respect for the saints who are in heaven so number five um we have the ability to trace our roots uh the roots of the church all the way back to the disciples with Peter being the first Pope. I'll never forget when I was in Rome, uh, I was traveling abroad uh, probably about six, seven years ago now. And I was in Rome and I, I was at the Vatican and you saw right on the left-hand side, the um, a stone um, like tablet on the wall that was listing out all of the Popes from Peter all the way down to the present day Pope Francis. And it showed like the time that they were Pope um, and that was just, it, it was really powerful and moving to me because that just showcased everything that I was learning at the time. Um, in particular, when I was looking at the early church father documents and everything, and it really is a lineage that you could trace all the way back an unbroken chain of succession, all the way back to Peter. And, uh, it mirrored everything that I was reading when I was reading the early church fathers, the early church fathers, there were several, several authors who made a very adamant point to list out the succession of the bishops. It was a very strong um, foundation and a strong uh, basis for their claim that they were engaged with the true church because there were still false churches back 
uh, in the early church days. And so they had to have some basis, the apostles and the disciples and the followers of Christ and of the true faith had to have some basis to be able to go to these other um, these other churches and tell them, hey, you're not following the right church because uh, you're not in line with the successors of the apostles who were Christ's disciples. And so um, anyways, that is a really cool aspect about the Catholic faith, one that has just really continued to speak to me and just move me in such a profound way because um, that's something that, to be honest, part of my uh, you know journey back to the church, that was something that was a huge part. How do I know that whoever's preaching on the pulpit actually has the authority that Christ gave his apostles in order to preach and to draw people into unity? And so Christ didn't leave us floundering around trying to figure things out. No, he gave us a church and he established a church on a rock on Peter, on his confession, and that propelled the um, the succession that was passed on by the laying of hands. So this all throughout the New Testament, and that tradition continues all the way down to this present day. So that is really cool. Um, number six, we want unity for all Christians. Um, I think sometimes people look at Catholics and they think, well, you know, they don't really, uh, they're kind of in their own world. They're exclusive. They're, you know, they excommunicate people and the anathema. And they, they look at all this stuff and they kind of fantasize this idea in their head that Catholics don't want unity, which is counter and contrary to the very name Catholic. Catholic comes from the Greek word katholikos, which means uh, universal or of the whole. And so, uh, the Catholic Church literally is the universal inclusion of all believers. Um, if you look at the covenant history leading all the way up until the time of Christ, God's family kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then lo and behold, Jesus came. And it wasn't a covenant that was extended to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. And so the Catholic Church is the universal church, the church that through baptism we are incorporated into the body of Christ. And uh, to say that Catholics don't want unity among Christians goes completely against, first of all, Scripture in John 17, when Christ calls for unity and prays for unity. Um, but it also just goes against the facts. <laughs> the Catholic Church is arguably one of, the, uh, it's the largest inst Christian institution in the world, but arguably one of the most, um, one of the strongest forces for unity and inclusion into the full body of Christ through the ecumenical dialogues that uh, the the Pope and and several of the leaders are engaged in. And you just look at the lady as well. And so um, unity is massively important to us and a huge part of what we feel the evangelical mission is. So next up, uh, we don't believe we work our way to heaven. <laughs> Some people may believe they work their way to heaven. Um, but Catholics, the Catholic Church and its doctrines and dogmas does not believe that we work our way to heaven. Um, so it's, it's a combination when we look at what, uh, what justification kind of is built up on. I've, I've done some videos on this, so you can check them out on the channel. But uh, we believe that through and through, God's grace is the only thing that can save us and bring us to salvation. Um, but that grace, because of our free will, requires a cooperation with that grace. So God's going to give us all his grace as much as we will accept, because <laughs> God's not changing. He is consistent. He is goodness itself. He is love itself. And so he gives us the grace to transform us into children um, of himself. And uh, But that requires on our part a desire to be children of God. And so the to the measure that we conform ourselves to that and accept the grace that he's giving us and cooperate, cooperate with that, um, that is, is ultimately what our salvation is built upon, is God's grace through and through. This idea of working our way to heaven is a very, what we call Pelagian idea, pioneered by Pelagius in the fourth century. It's a very old idea. It's not something that Catholics believe. So we do not believe we work our way to heaven. Um, next up, Mass. Uh, we definitely want people to know, non-Catholics to know that the Mass, it's not a re-sacrificing of Christ, 
but it's the representation um, of Christ's once for all sacrifice. There's a lot of theology behind this. I'm not going to get into that in this video, but uh, there is a, a common theme among uh, some particularly anti-Catholic uh, circles, non-Catholic circles um, that are vehemently anti-Catholic. They, they posit this idea that uh, Catholics uh, think they are re-sacrificing Christ on the altar every single Sunday whenever they celebrate Mass because we believe that it is, the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And um, that's not the case. Just read kind of the bylaws and the, uh, you know, the catechism, if you will, to have a fuller understanding of the belief. But we believe that there's a representation of Christ's sacrifice in Calvary. It's represented by him. The short and skinny of it is as Christ died, uh, was buried, three days later, rose again. He rose to fullness of life, newness of life, ascended into heaven to where he lives eternally, therefore eternally making reparations and drawing people closer to him and eternally offering himself to the Father on our behalf um, no matter what. And he's doing it consistently in a very eternal state. And so we believe that he, every single time that um, the successors of his disciples uh, approach the altar and take the elements, the bread and the wine, and offer them up to God. What God has given us, we offer back up to him. And when they invoke the words that he taught them, um, this is my body, this is my blood, that something actual happens on the spiritual side of things. That God, uh, Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity comes down um, and is represented under the form of bread and wine. So again, not re-sacrificing, but representation. And uh, there's a lot of theology behind that. Again, we'll, we'll dive into that in some future videos, but uh, we definitely want people, uh, non-Catholics, to know that. Um, number nine, we love you. So as, Catholic, as Catholics to non-Catholics, we love you very much so and fully believe that you are brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, this was an interesting thing that my wife told me once um, that always stuck out to her about Catholics that she would meet is she would always meet a lot of anti-Catholics or non-Catholics who were uh, very, very anti-Catholic and they did not see Catholics as her brothers and sisters in Christ. And one of the really compelling things to her about the Catholic Church was that uh, you always had a very consistent message that those who are not Catholic are still our brothers and sisters in Christ in virtue of their baptism. When you're baptized, you're baptized into the body of Christ. And that doesn't change whether you're Catholic, Orthodox, Pentecostal, Methodist. It doesn't matter. Your baptism is what incorporates you into the body of Christ. So we love you. We don't think you're anything less because you're not incorporated in the Catholic Church. But, and this is point number 10, you are invited to uh, come into full communion with Christ in the Eucharist. We are Eucharistic people. Christ lives and ebbs and flows through us. We are his hands and feet in the world. And the best way for us to be able to go out effectively to evangelize the culture and evangelize the world really is to be what Christ has called us to be. And that is a people of the Eucharist, the people of himself. And we are constantly fed and nourished by Christ himself. And we do that by gathering at the altar and receiving our Lord in the Eucharist in a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And so you are, while you are brothers, we want full communion. We want everybody to be united under uh, the banner that Christ has set out for us. Um, and that's gonna take dialogue and that's gonna take conversation and that's gonna take, you know, having good talks about a lot of really great things and asking all the tough questions. And um, that's my prayer uh, on this note, is that we continue to have and foster good dialogue among all Christians, that we can come to a deeper understanding and a deeper pursuit of our Lord into a more intimate communion with him over time. So anyways, there you have it. My 10 things that I think I want Catholics, or 10 things that Catholic Christians want non-Christians to know non-Catholic Christians, <laughs> 10 things Catholic Christians want, non-Catholic Christians, and we'll lump them in, non-Christians to know. So 
Take it for what it's worth. Leave your comments in the comment section below. And if you haven't already, hit the like button. Pound the subscribe button so you can get more of this awesome content. From all of us here at Practical Theism, we'll catch you next time. Thanks.